Good morning. Before we begin, I would like to note that we are recording uh, today's channels uh, for those who are unable to be here. Um, if you do not need want to be recorded, there's no worry. Um, as long as you keep your camera off, you will not be included in the video footage. It is with both pride and gratitude that I welcome you all to our 40th annual Edward B. Sparrow Symposium titled Reimagining Freedom, Abolition as a Practice. I'm Kanisha Askew, Assistant Director of the Toll Public Interest Center. I am privileged to work with countless Penn Carey Law students who are committed to doing the work of dismantling the systems meant to limit access to justice for all. This year, the Sparrow Symposium serves as the grand finale to our annual Public Interest Week which featured a series of programs aimed at examining how we can reframe America and its legacy of racial injustice. Today, we will continue in that spirit as we explore abolitionism as a framework to free our society of state surveillance and punitive norms. You will have the opportunity to hear from a host of brilliant leaders in the abolitionist movement, lawyers, professors, practitioners, activists, and more, who have been invited here by our incredible second year Toll Public Interest Scholars. These students have worked skillfully and passionately over the past several months to craft a symposium that will provide answers to not only why abolishing the carceral state in all its forms is an ethical and moral imperative, but also what a free society can look like and how we can all work towards such a future. If I must admit, I sometimes struggle with the concepts of freedom and liberation. I wrestle with the interplay between systems and individual actors and question how my own positionality can make a difference when so many of the issues we face are systemic. Does individual work towards justice make a difference and can oppressive systems actually be abolished? After all, they are so deeply woven into the fabric of our society. I rarely have the answers. But when I find myself almost paralyzed by my own questions, instead of shrinking back, I press forward. Edward B. Sparrow himself held a conviction that struggling with problems of poverty is imperative for society. And while the problems are not limited to poverty, the conviction still holds. We must struggle. The carceral state exists like air. We do not always know we are breathing it in or that it is actually toxic air until we find ourselves choking. As a Black woman born into both communal richness and economic poverty in the rural South, four generations removed from the abolition of slavery, but hardly removed from the familiarity of prison bars and child protective service calls, my own life has been punctuated over and over again by the carceral state. Yet it's even hard for me to imagine an alternative. After all, there's comfort in the known, even if what we know is suffocation. It's tempting to think of freedom and liberation as abstract and spiritual concepts that are not possible in the here and now, but we must have a working definition of freedom and liberation to even begin to reimagine. I like Professor Kiyanga Yamada Taylor's definition. She says, Black liberation implies a world where Black people can live in peace without the constant threat of the social, economic, and political woes of a society that places almost no value on the vast majority of Black lives. But it doesn't stop there. Black liberation is bound up in collective liberation and social transformation, and it is marked by solidarity. So as we prepare to dive deep into what abolitionism is and how we can work towards it, I challenge us all to hold in our minds just what freedom is. From there, we can reimagine and move forward in action. I will now turn it over to Megan Russo.
Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for being here with us virtually uh, so early in the morning. Um, as Kanisha mentioned, my name is Megan Russo. I'm a current second year student at Penn Carey Law and a Toll Public Interest Scholar. Um, I know you guys are all waiting for our very exciting keynote. I am personally, but before we get started, I have a few logistics that I want to go through first and foremost. Uh, we want to send a huge, huge, huge thank you to all of the people that helped us today and throughout this planning process and in guiding us, especially to Kenesha, who you all just saw. Um, so first, we would also just like to thank our incredible panelists uh, for agreeing to be part of the symposium and for participating in these meaningful and important conversations. We also thank them for their inspiring scholarship and engagement in the communities in which they live and work. We'd also, of course, like to thank Dean Rigger, Dean Lynn, and Dimitri uh, for the institutional support they have provided. If you are a Penn Law student, you know that they are institutional and incredible. Um, we're privileged to be able to host this kind of talk at Penn Law. Um, we're also thankful to Yoko Takahashi for developing our beautiful publicity materials, which you'll see throughout the course of the day, um, and going back and forth with us multiple times and being incredibly patient. <laughs> Um, we owe gratitude to the talented professors, of course, at Penn Law um, that provided invaluable advice and guidance. We also thank our fellow students uh, for all of their guidance and stage advice throughout this process. Finally, and again, like I said, most importantly, we would like to thank the Toll Public Interest Center for their generous and unwavering support. We are thankful, especially for Kenesha. Again, truly none of this, I would like to emphasize, would be possible without Kenesha and her guidance um, and leadership there. This event would definitely not have happened without her. We'd also like to thank Emily Sutcliffe for her big picture vic vision, uh, Victoria Gillison and Kelsey Ulam for their support in bringing this symposium together and Arlene Rivera Finkelson for her willingness and gui to guide us throughout our time at Penn Law. We've learned so much from all of you and your willingness to mentor and listen to us has invariably shaped our career paths and personal lives for the better. So truly a huge thank you from all of us to you all. Okay, now for more housekeeping things, and then I promise, I promise, I promise we will get to the big events. Um, so first, uh, if you have a question during the event, please submit it through the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. If you have been on Zooms before, you're familiar with this. If you have not, it's a little chat box at the bottom that says Q&A. So you can use that to submit questions. You can do so anonymously or with your name. We'll try, do our best to answer the questions during the Q&A at the end of the keynote address. Uh, for all the lawyers out there, if you are seeking CLE credit for today's event, please note that CLE codes will be announced twice during the event, during this particular part of the event. Write down these codes and be sure to enter them on your digital evaluation form once the event is over. Uh, the evaluation form is mandatory to receive your CLE credit, so you have to remember to do it or you will not get these credits. The link to the digital evaluation form was emailed to you in your confirmation email, but if you didn't get it or you cannot pull it up at this moment, please find the link. We're going to put it into the chat feature so you can access it more easily. Um, again, these codes, they tell us how long you attended the event and they are mandatory to receive CLE credit. We will remind you of this plenty of times throughout the day. Um, but for those of you who are doing this, take note, your first word is change. Again, so write this down if you're trying to get CLE credit. Your first word is change. Okay, now, without further ado, I am very pleased and incredibly excited, I've been looking forward to this for a while, uh, to introduce our keynote speaker, Josie Duffy Rice. Uh, so Josie Duffy Rice is a journalist and law school graduate whose work is primarily focused on prosecutors, prisons, and other criminal justice issues. Currently, she is president of The Appeal, a news publication that publishes original journalism and about the criminal justice system. Josie co-hosts the podcast, Justice in America. She is a 2020 New America Fellow, a 2019, 2020 to 2020 Type Media Fellow, and a Civic Media Fellow at the University of Southern California's Annenberg Innovation Lab. Her work has been featured in the New York Times, Vanity Fair, The New Yorker, The Atlantic, Slate, and among many others. Uh, Josie is a graduate of Harvard Law School and received her bachelor's degree from Columbia University. She lives in Atlanta uh, with her husband and two children. Um, okay, I will just go ahead and kick it off to her. Thank you so much. Thank you, Megan, and thank you everybody for having me. I'm so excited and honored 
to be here. Um, I was a fairly ambivalent uh, and lost law student. So I am very grateful and blown away anytime I'm offered to speak to anybody in law school or lawyers. And I so appreciate the opportunity to talk to you guys today. Um, and I'm really excited to talk to you all about abolition. I have just been thrilled to see how much traction it's gained, especially over the past few months, obviously because of fairly, you know, continually bad circumstances. Um, but I think it's a very exciting time <clears throat> to be having this conversation and I'm excited to have it with you all today. So my plan is to talk and then open it up for Q and A, but if you have questions, you can type them in the um, box and I'll answer them that way. And I might stop in the middle, depending on how things are going and what questions there are and answer some in the middle as well. Um, so thank you so much. Um, I, 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 before I get into police abolition, I thought I'd tell you all a little bit about my background because I think it provides a, a little bit of context about why this issue has taken up so much space in my brain for the, the past 12 years. So my first real criminal justice job was about 12 years ago or right out of college. Um, I worked at the public defender's office in the Bronx at the Bronx Defenders and I was just an assistant. I was 21, um, I was new to work in general, much less uh, criminal justice work, but um, it had a very profound effect on me and, and shaped the rest of my professional career. And it was the reason I, I ended up going to law school. And when I was in law school, I um, did all the criminal justice things there were to do in law school, all the clinics and all the clubs and everything, um, represented clients and represented inmates um, who were facing parole hearings. And then I graduated and went into policy work and um, I uh, did some technical assistance in courts. And so I point all of this out just to say that if in general, I've worked in pretty much all the different criminal justice fields other than academia, um, local, state, federal work, I've done um, all of that policy and direct representation. Um, and I've so I've come at this issue from a lot of different angles and all of it has really shaped the way that I feel about the criminal justice system. Um, and so I now run um, the appeal. I left lawyering about five years ago and went into journalism where I cover I covered the criminal justice system for many years. And then um, I now run the appeal and we focus primarily on criminal justice. Um, we've actually expanded recently and now we focus on more than just criminal justice. We say we focus on the issues that keep people up at night, but overall that tends to mean issues that are directly related to, if not explicitly criminal justice. Um, and, and so it's been really, again, really fascinating to see this conversation about abolition open up so broadly. Um, I was given kind of wide latitude on what to talk about with you all. So I thought I'd start going through some of the overarching frameworks that I think are helpful to think about when we think about prison abolition. And I'll say that everything I know about prison abolition, police abolition, the abolition of the carceral state, I learned from other people. Um, people like Ruth Wilson Gilmore, people like Miriam Kaba have been talking about this idea and the potential for a new world for decades. Um, and so I always want to give credit to the people who have built so much of this. Um, sorry, that's my phone. I turned it off. Um, built so much of this, um, you know, over over time, so that when the when there was when there was you know movement enough to be a bigger conversation, a lot of this work had been done. So I think it makes sense to start by asking a really basic question, which is, why do we have prisons in law enforcement? Why do these systems exist? And there are some theoretical answers and some historical answers, but let's start with the theoretical ones, right? The first reason that, the, the first, um, yeah, the first reason that we have this state, right, is in theory to keep us safe. The idea is that law enforcement keeps us safe, that prisons keep us safe, and that these systems, however distasteful they may be, even though sometimes they do the wrong thing, ultimately they are protecting the rest of us um, from harm, right? From, from people who, who cause harm. Um, but, you know, the first response I, I try to give to people when we talk about this is, is just acknowledging that, they're, that these systems are doing a very bad job of keeping us safe, if that is the purpose that they are meant to serve. So in many cities, in many places, police solve about half of homicides. 
um, that's not that's not an exception to the rule. That's basically the rule. And homicides are basically the, their best track record, right? When we talk about um, a world without police, in particular, people say, well, what about rape? What about murder? What about violent crime? But they, it's important to keep in mind that, that police are not actually solving much of, in fact, most of those crimes, right? About 10%, <clears throat> the theory is that about 10% of rapes get solved, um, that you know, about 30% of violent crimes get solved much much fewer property crime gets solved and the and again only about about half you know 50 to 60 percent of homicides um what that tells us is that we have a system that is not working you can go outside right now kill someone and have a 50 percent chance of getting away with it right the 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 accountability system that police are supposed to provide when it only works a third to half of the time is not actually doing its job at keeping us safe, right? Um, you know, violent crime is only about 4% of what police do day to day. Um, what they actually do instead is stuff like non-emergency calls, right? Traffic stops. And this isn't me being snarky or pejorative. This is what the numbers say, right? People become law enforcement, I think, um, often to provide safety because they do think that it is um, a job where you're you're fighting the bad guys, but that's not what the job is. And instead of shifting the incentives of the job, we've just continually funded it. We've just continually thrown more money at it with less accountability. And it's it has created what we have today, which is that um, we have a system that that fails to solve the the most important crimes that we want to have solved. Right. So so the story I I think um, I. Think about when I think about this is is about something that happened to me about a year ago, which is that I was sitting on Zoom. I've been working um, remotely for six years, so I'm a couple steps ahead of everybody else who's um, learning the Zoom life in the past year. So I'm sitting on Zoom on a staff call. It's our Christmas party, which means we're all having cocktails at home uh, via Zoom, and all of a sudden. Um, the glass in the room where I'm sitting shatters. And my first thought is like, like, is this a, a brick? Is someone breaking in? Did someone hit, um, hit, hit, you know, run into my house with a car? And it turned out that it was a hawk, a huge hawk had, was trying to catch a squirrel, flew into my window and the hawk and the squirrel are now in my house. Okay. I had a young kid at the time. I now have two young kids. I had a young kid, my mother-in-law was here. She was in a wheelchair and the hawk is huge. And I have no idea what to do. So I ran out of the room and I called, um, I looked up animal control and I called animal control. And animal control was like, it's late on a Friday. You can try us again on Monday. And I was like, I can't have a hawk in my house for, for two days. And they were like, well, uh, call the cops. And so I then called a private animal expert, like a private animal um, control facility. And they were like, we can't make it out there until tomorrow night, call the cops. I called the fire department. Fire department's like, we can't help you. We don't do big ant big birds. You should call the cops. I tell that story to tell you, to, to point out that like the cops have no expertise at catching hawks, right? They're not animal control. They've not been trained to be animal control, but we have projected on to our police state so much responsibility that I didn't have, it turned out that we managed to get the hawk out without any police intervention, but that would have been my next move. I would have had to call the cops to do something that they're not trained nor qualified to do. I would have had to bring the police into my house with, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm black, my family is black. I, I don't particularly want the police in my house. Um, in an emergency situation, but that would have been the only option I had in that moment. Um, and I and I and and for police officers, they don't want to be getting a hawk out of my house either. But because we have um, projected so much responsibility onto our police state, it has resulted in a system where we've siphoned out so many other resources um, from other systems because we think the police can do it. Another story I like to tell is that. Um, is that uh, is that of a man named Henry Earl, who um, lived in Kentucky um, 
his whole life and is now in his 70s. It's not clear actually where Henry Earl is these days, but um, wherever he is, he's he's got 70, 70, 70, um, 75. So Henry Earl had um, a really rough childhood, developmental delays, and got arrested for his first um, his first time when he was 19. Uh, and this was in about 1968. Um, he was arrested for something petty, nothing violent. Um, and it, it started a pattern. Um, that was also the first year he was homeless, right? He was homeless for the next 50 years of his life. And for over that 50 years, he was arrested 1,500 times. 1,500 times. Never once for anything violent never once for causing any sort of actual harm, but almost consistently and almost always for, for public drunkenness. Henry Earl was an alcoholic, right? And um, instead of getting the help he needs or being able to be an alcoholic by himself in his house, like many alcoholics are when they are housed, Henry Earl was, was basically every week um, for 50 years thrown into prison um, or into jail where he stayed for two or three days and, and left. This to me epitomizes so much of the problem with the carceral state because so much of what we hear about the carceral state are the worst stories, right? We hear these stories about black men, unarmed black men getting shot in the street, which obviously is a tragedy. We hear the stories about George Floyd, someone kneeling on his neck and killing him for eight minutes. And all of those are harrowing. They're horrible. It, they're unimaginable, but the actual more common harm is something like what happens to Henry Earl, right? He's an extreme example, but he is a very real example of what happens in a society that doesn't have any way to deal with pain, addiction, homelessness than the carceral state. Henry Earl, if the, if the carceral state's purpose is to keep us safe, which is the first one I, I, I in my list of three, Henry Earl is it, arresting Henry Earl 1500 times can't possibly serve that purpose, right? It can't possibly be a good use of resources. And it's not helping. You know, you would think by the 1400th time, <laughs> they would start to think maybe this just isn't effective. But that's not actually how the carceral state has operated in our society. Derricka Purnell, who's a brilliant thinker and another um, lawyer turned writer, wrote an article where she said that basically historically, and this includes in black communities, um, that we've thought police were safety because we didn't know anything else. And so that isn't always true, right? But even in some, even in some communities that are ravaged by the police, um, the tone is that the police are not doing enough, that if they were doing enough, there would be less harm. If they were thinking enough about, um, about victims, especially victims of color, they would be making more arrests and, and, um, and be doing and, and, and ensuring more consequences. And it's not that I believe that the police have what's best for people of color in mind. It's that I don't actually think that that conclusion would lead us to a better situation. And what we see in America is that the, the, the carceral state is not ensuring safety. It's just not. So the second thing that police um, and law enforcement are supposed to do is to keep us accountable, right? They're supposed to make sure there are consequences for our actions. Um, and in some ways that's about safety, but otherwise it's just sort of about, about a moral structure to a society where if you do something wrong, there are consequences for that, right? But as I pointed out, they're not really great at addressing wrongdoing, right? Um, so there's the, the one side of that is just that they're failing. The other side of that is that in the process of giving them the power to keep us accountable, to ensure consequences, we've created a system of complete unaccountability for them. So as we know, police have the legal right functionally to beat, to torture, to kill. There are barely any consequences for police misbehavior at all. Um, and we also know, right, that um, that the system rewards bad behavior, that it, that it punishes um, nuanced thinking about the system, that it punishes pushback, that um, it rewards more arrests more punishment and more consequences. And that that trickles down from not just police, but through prosecutor, but the prosecute for prosecutorial system, through prisons. Um, and the lack of accountability in the system has um, has made it so that as as people, as as civilians, we have so little power and control over the state 
which has all the power and control over us, right? So the third last primary reason of what people say when you say, oh, why do we have police in prisons is that, um, is that, uh, and this is the theoretical answer, right? That prisons are supposed to be for people whom regular society is unable to, to address. And, and the point is that the rest of us can then enjoy our freedom. The argument is that in a free society, we have to be very, very um, vigilant about rooting out the people who are, are making it hard for us to live a, a life of freedom. Um, but you know, when I think about who makes our life less free, it is not the, the, the threat of civilian crime in particular that I think is is so um, is is actually Im, Im, impeding our freedom. It is um, the threat of of law enforcement, right? It has made us all less free because it's served as a mask for other issues and things we need to address. So in practice, prisons have become our way of addressing societal problems. We've used them as a back end tool by which we are expected to fix front end problems and. Um, and, and by that, I mean, it's a back-end tool by which we're supposed to fix poverty, right? It's a back-end tool by which we were supposed to, we're supposed to fix a lack of opportunity, a lack of jobs, a lack of housing, a lack of schools, right? We have disinvested from systems on the front end um, and, and poured all those resources and responsibility in the back end. And, and not only is that a moral abomination, an ethical failure on the part of our society, but it's also um, unsustainable. We can't live in a world that depends exclusively or primarily on law enforcement to create societal structures, societal, societal opportunities, and also societal consequences, right? Law enforcement is not supposed to be the first stop um, in a situation that, that needs addressing. It's supposed to be the last. And right now we've failed to ensure that system. So um, you think about the school to prison pipeline, right? Um, you think about criminalizing poverty and and status crimes and um, and it, you know if you were to go into any maximum security prison um, in the country, you would find a wide variety of people. You might find people who did something so heinous that you can't wrap your mind around it, but you'd also find many people who are not out of the bounds of what we consider a societal standard of humanity. And the fact that we shove everybody into the same space without differentiation or care is a sign of our own failures and not just the failures of individuals, right? So I do wanna make the point that um, these are theoretical responses to what people say when you say, what about police and prisons, but they're not the actual historical context, right? Um, the, the, the best interpretations of why these institutions exist, the best histories of why these institutions exist are absolutely inextricable from race, from slavery, from racism, and from the American, um, the, the history of, of racism in America. So this is a racially biased system. It was born out of slavery. We basically didn't have police until, um, in, in the way that we think of them, until about the mid 1800s when police were basically uh, created and, um, and used to police black people, to police slaves in the South, to police black people in the North. Um, and it, it exploded in the years um, after slavery during reconstruction, our prison system did. It has um, been racially biased since its inception. It was created again out of um, racism and there is no separating policing in America, prisons in America from the subjugation of black people. It's impossible, okay? It is not me being PC. This is not me being extreme. This is not identity politics. This is history, right? And, and, and we don't always have a great grasp of history in this country in general, particularly when it comes to law enforcement. Policing cannot be compared to policing in Denmark or um, policing in China or policing in, um, in, in Nigeria, or, you know, there might be things that, that, that are woven into all of these systems that make them so harsh. But American policing is unique in part because of its relationship with black subjugation. And I think it's important to keep that in mind. When people ask, why do police exist? Why do we need them? Well, police didn't exist until we wanted to police black people and not for doing violent things, not even for 
running, not even for, you know, being runaway slaves, right? We wanted to police black people for petty crimes to make sure that they were scared in the same way that we often police black people for petty crimes now. Um, in an article I wrote last, last summer about police abolition, I wrote that um, in white communities, crime prevention is, you know, in, in white communities, we, we, um, we treat cancer through prevention, right? We treat cancer through making sure, um, um, uh, you know, you have clean air and clean environments, right? In black communities, we basically use chemotherapy. And that's the analogy to, to prisons. Prisons and police are chemotherapy, right? And the ways in which we use them in black communities are to, to, um, to try to make up for the fact that we don't invest in communities of color and poor communities with actual societal resources. So, um, you know, I, I, I think it's important um, to point out also that police have a history of violence. And so when we wanna uh, talk about violence in society, we have traditionally not talked about state violence. When we talk about the casualties of the system, we rarely talk about counterfactuals, but you know, you can live in a world with no, with no crime, with no civilian crime. Those worlds exist basically, essentially, right? For example, um, I'll give you two examples and you tell me which one you'd prefer. There is, uh, in North Korea, there's very little civilian crime, very little, because obviously um, with a government that is so focused on punishment um, and so repressive, you, the, 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 the threat of civilian crime is, is basically minimal because the punishments are so high. People don't, you know, they're not, a lot, they're, at least they're not caught very often committing civilian crime in North Korea because, um, the punishments for example stealing you know stealing a snack from from a corner store are so extreme that um nobody does it there are also countries like um countries with strong welfare states right some european countries etc where there's basically no crime there's universal health care the schools are good there are parks um there's um strong regulation around the environment um, there's opportunities, job opportunities, and in those communities, also crime is 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 civilian crime is less, and there's still um, freedom, right? It's not North Korea. The reason I point that out is because um, it's crucial, I think, to when we talk about abolition, when we talk about um, what the world could look like. People like to think that. Um, it's just so pie in the sky, and I understand why that is. It's obviously hard to imagine, but it, it exists, right? It, it really does exist in, in some places. So there are places without civilian crime and they can look like North Korea, they could look like a country with a strong social safety net, but there are also um, environments without criminalization. Um, and so by that, I mean, um, look at the suburbs, right? In America right now, if you go to a, a wealthy, a, a middle-class or upper middle-class suburb in much of America, there is almost very little um, there's very little criminalization. So um, if your kid is caught smoking weed in their house, right, you may punish them um, yourself, but you may, you're not probably going to call the cops, right? Kids and adults make mistakes, sometimes illegal mistakes, very often in all kinds of communities, but only in some of them are the police and prison so intimately involved. Um, only in some of them can you be walking down the street and be stop and frisk, right? Only in some of them do you have to bring your ID when you go visit a friend's apartment building. Only in some of them do we criminalize parents the way that we tend to do in, in poor and, and communities of color. And the, the point I wanna make is that like, in some ways, police abolition exists right now in America in certain communities. It's just that it's not the communities that we tend to worry about, right? But it's there's evidence that when you at least reduce the footprint of the carceral state, even if crime doesn't technically go down, right? The impact of crime, the impact of what we think of crime um, is, is reduced drastically. And I don't mean serious crimes like rape or murder. What I mean is, um, again, like crimes that maybe don't have the same sort of impact on people um, like low level drug use, right? Or, or drug use at all. We think about um, America as being a carceral state pretty exclusively, and that is true to a certain extent, but it's also true that um, 
that some communities don't experience that at all. So let me talk a little bit about what abolition means and then I'll open it up for questions. Um, the first thing that I want to think about, um, the first point I wanna make is that abolition is about creation and not about destruction. So this is something that Miriam Kaba, Ruth Wilson Gilmore have driven home really intensely in their work, but it's a very important point because when you talk about defund the police or abolish prisons or abolish the carceral state, what people imagine is let's take the world we have right now and just eliminate these elements from it tomorrow. Um, and the reality is that's not what we're saying. We are not arguing um, that we should just get rid of these systems without replacing them with some, something else. We're not arguing that the world that we live in right now is conducive or ready for a total elimination of any sort of law enforcement structure tomorrow. What we're arguing is that you can create, we can imagine and we can work towards the creation of a world, not where we just don't have a carceral state, but where a carceral state is not necessary. It is very difficult to imagine a safer, a more humane and a less violent America in particular, because America has a history of violence, because we have a history of gun violence, right? Because even though crime is um, on average lower right now than it has been in decades, we're still one of the more violent countries, um, um, you know, in the world, really. Um, but, the, but we don't have to be that way. We can impart values. Um, we, can, we can create a, a society and communities where um, violence and the impact of violence and the impact of harm um, is greatly reduced without the, um, without the influence of, of um, the carceral state, without using fear and punishment as reasons that people um, are incentivized to do the right thing. Um, uh, so I think understanding that abolition is actually about creating other systems, creating a new world, creating new values, and creating new ways of accountability is crucial when you think about it, because it's not just about getting rid of something. It's actually about creating something new um, and, and, a, and a new world, but rather than immediately get rid of anything, right? Um, but, and then, and then another point I wanna make about abolition um, is that again, people see it as being really pie in the sky. And so so do I sometimes, right? The first time anybody talked to me about carceral abolition, I was like, okay, yeah, whatever, right? Um, so I think um, what's important to remember is that it is not just theoretical in the minds of people who do this work, me included, right? In fact, it is deeply, deeply related to relationships to people and to harm. So I'm going to read you a quote that Miriam Kaba said um, that um, is in her upcoming book, which I highly recommend people buy, which comes out, I think, this month. Um, and, and she talks about narratives. And she basically says, I'm so uninterested in narratives. That word gets used often, narrative building. People that want to be all about narrative shifting, narrative building. I believe that when we are in relationship with each other, we influence each other. And what matters to me what matters to me as a unit of interest is relationships. The second thing that matters to me as a unit of impact is harm. I want to figure out how to transform harm in every possible context because I have been harmed and I have harmed other people. My political commitments are to developing stronger relationships with people and to transforming harm. I think that this is a very crucial point that there is no um, world in which well, let me say this. When I started working at the Bronx Defenders 12 years ago, I really thought, and this is embarrassing now, but I really thought what public defenders did was mostly get innocent people out of prison, right? I thought most of our clients were innocent. And I thought, you know, I didn't realize that there was a very strong difference between, for example, the local public defender and the innocence project or something like that. And then once I kind of understood that not everybody in our practice was innocent, I, I, I moved on to, well, you know, I really, I, I think it's very important to address the people who have done something not that bad, who have jumped the turnstile, who have, um, you know, committed a nonviolent drug offense. Those are the people that really um, garnered my sympathy. And then as I sort of moved on from that, I, I, I recognize that, um, that people who have done very horrible things still, um, still were human, um, still were capable of good and still deserved some sympathy and empathy. 
Um, but I, I had convinced myself at some point, right, that deep down, everybody is, nobody is capable of harm if society has not um, taught them about harm, if society has not done harm to them. I thought, I, I had told myself that everybody was a victim of their circumstance and nobody um, was necessarily accountable for what they had really, really done, right? And it's easy to tell yourself that because the carceral state is awful, that everybody in prison, um, everybody in the system is um, an angel. But that is not a full story because none of us are angels. You know, nobody is all good or all bad. And the truth is that people, um, some people have committed really, really horrible crimes. Um, and it's, and you can't, um, you can't guarantee that with a better society, nothing bad would ever happen, that nobody would ever do something bad. Right. Um, but that conclusion, the fact that people are complicated and the fact that the system is complicated and the fact that we can't necessarily predict the future has made me more confident in my belief that we should abolish the state, not less confident. I don't think we have a fighting chance of people becoming the best person, the best people that they can be um, without um, addressing the carceral state. And I don't think we have a fighting chance of creating a society that works as best as possible for everybody without abolishing the carceral state. Um, so I, I want to um, give a, um, a hypothetical um, before I close. And I hope people have questions. I don't see any in the box, but I'll answer, ask me, you know, I like the complicated questions. I like the tough ones and I'm not gonna know the answer to everything. So I'd love to hear, um, you know, what irks you all and what confuses you all and what questions you have about a system like this. But I, I wanna um, present a hypothetical. And I and again, I, I'm taking this from the accountability work of, of Miriam Cobbin in large part, because um, when I first went to my first conference on this, she presented this hypothetical and it really brought home why this stuff is so complicated. So um, the question is, let's say, let's say that we all believe that we should abolish the carceral state. Let's agree to that, right? Let's say that right now we're in our apartment and we hear next door our neighbor fighting, a couple fighting, and we hear the husband um, abusing his wife today, right? What do you do in a situation like that if you don't believe in the carceral state? So when Miriam asked this question, we all you know, sat there kind of uncomfortably for a while and then um, pretty much all of us said we would call the police, right? And I think that is the logical answer in a situation where you hear someone being harmed. I think that is a logical answer in the world that we live in right now. But I think um, the response to that and the world that we can imagine, right, is a very important one. And the world that we can imagine, the work has to come in before you hear your neighbor beating their wife. So People are accountable um, to fear. They're accountable of the threat of the system, but they're also accountable to the people around them, to their families um, and to their neighbors and to their friends if there is relationship there. And I think this is what Miriam says when she means, when she says that um, relationship is the, her unit of interest. When you create relationships with your neighbors, when you create relationships with your community, when you can um, ensure other people's safety um, without the, the, the impact of the carceral state, you can maybe go downstairs and knock on your neighbor's door and say, I hear something going on here. I'm very concerned. What can I do? You can invite, you know, you can help this woman um, find a place to go immediately. You can ensure that the rest of the community holds the, the man in the situation accountable. And you may be able to prevent um, some of this from happening in the first place, if there is a system of accountability, expectation, and community among the, the neighborhood that you live in, right? Um, that's not to say that in every situation, knocking on the door prevents the harm, but it's to say that I certainly don't have a close enough relationship with my neighbors traditionally to, um, to, to ask if I can help, to knock on the door, to try to stop harm in harm's way. And our lack of community, our lack of relationships um, is not only caused by our carceral system that breaks them, um, but it's, it's reflected in the society we have where um, 
are we're, we're not always intentional about our communities. We're not always intentional about person to person accountability. And we're not always intentional about finding, um, by the time that a harm actually occurs, we don't have many other options in the carceral state. What we're trying to create is a world where there are other options, where there are other ways of, um, of imagining a future. So I think I'm gonna stop there for now. I talked a lot. Um, I hope, um, I hope I didn't put anybody to sleep this early in the morning. And I have, um, I have time to answer any questions that anybody might have. Great, thank you so much. Um, I really enjoyed that. I hope others did as well. We have a few um, questions coming into the Q&A, folks, oh, a lot. <laughs> so if folks wanna keep putting it in there, we'll oh, as many as we can. Um, but before we do that, it is the CLE quick reminder time. Um, earlier, it seems a couple people missed the word and because it was a little bit before 9 a.m. and I tend to speak fast, my apologies. Um, the first word, this will be the only time we do this. Uh, the first word was change. So that's C-H-A-N-G-E. So again, the first word was change for if you're trying to get CLE credit. And now the second word the second word is justice. So again, that's justice, J-U-S-T-I-C-E is the second word. And we put this in the chat for the form, but as a reminder, I didn't say this before, but if you're seeking CLE credit, you need to submit this form at the end of the day after you've attended all of the panels you're going to attend. So just submit the form once. So the two words for today was change, and justice. Hopefully everyone got that this time around. Um, okay, now back to Q&A. Yeah, I see them now. Sorry, I was looking in the chat, but I'm looking at the Q&A. So these are some great questions. I'm um, thrilled to answer them. So um, Josh Spielberg asked, since abolition is not just about getting rid of things, what about changing slogans to reflect that? E exa um, for example, instead of defund the police, use fund public safety, not police. Um, well, I think uh, there are a couple answers to your questions. The first is that, um, you know, there's a lot of pushback on defund the police as a slogan, and I understand it, right? People always say, like, what about reform the police? What about fund something else, et cetera? But the reality is that, like, all of us heard the slogan for the first time in June, and it's actually gotten a lot of um, traction since then. It's also gotten a lot of pushback, but people do understand the concept of us needing to spend less resources on um, policing. And so I, I don't know if fun public safety, not police would be technically a better slogan, but I, I do believe that it is important to talk about the need to think about how we use our resources. Um, in local governments, resources are a fixed pie, right? In state governments, resources are a fixed pie. It's not like the federal government. And the fact that we shovel so much money into law enforcement and into prisons literally takes dollars away from the rest of our system. So when we talk about defund the police, I think it is both about influence, but also about the need to discuss resources. And the fact that it is um, that people bristle at this slogan, I think in some ways is not is a benefit, not, not a harm. We are talking about big ideas. We're talking about big solutions. And um, not everybody is gonna love big solutions at the beginning, but it's part of our responsibility to continue to talk about them. So someone asked about privileged young men who perform a thrill killing, how would I address this? So um, the first answer is that it's not getting addressed now. <laughs> um, the privileged young men who, the reason you know that this is a thing is because it happens, right? And the fact that it happens is reflective of a system that um, doesn't prevent crime. So I, I don't know that our system would, you know, that a different system needs to even be better than it is right now at addressing this. I, I think that it, I think that um, it just needs to not be worse. But the answer is that um, you want to create young men who don't per perform thrill killings, right? Like you want to impart values and um, morals and ethics and um, and and relationships into people so that they don't commit the crimes that we we imagine them. Um, committing because I, you're not gonna you're not gonna get rid of all crime, of course. You're not gonna get rid of all harm, but we think that harm is inevitable, although we do very little to try to prevent harm, right? And the question is, if we actually tried to prevent harm, would we be able to um, stop things in their tracks before they begin, right? And I think that is, um, you know, 
when you think about the worst example, what we're not, we're not saying um, we, what we're trying to say is that we, we want the worst examples to not even have to happen. And that that takes investment on the front end and a complete reimagination of society. Um, Daniel asked a really great question about what it means to be an abolitionist lawyer and that lawyers must inherently work within the system at least to an extent. And I love this question because I think it's so important. There's a great quote um, someone said, I don't know, maybe someone said it on Twitter. I don't even know if it's like a real quote, but about the need to push at a system from all sides to get it to topple, right? And I know that my, I, you know, um, I'm not a practicing lawyer, but all my friends are, and they're all, they all are public defenders or immigration lawyers. And this is a constant question they have, right? Am I reinforcing the system by working within it? But every single day, there are people who need you to actively for help. When someone gets arrested, when someone is harmed by the system, we can't say, hold on, just wait, we're going to get to abolition soon, you know, and the rest of us are doing that. The people, the lawyers in the system who are doing the kind of work um, at, the, at the public defender's office, for example, who are, who are representing immigration clients, who are doing housing work, who are doing family law, these are people who are heroes. They're doing God's work every single day. And although they are working within a system that exists, they, the, the unit of value here is the help that they are providing to real people who are experiencing the harms of that system every single day. So it might be an internal um, conflict, but I hope it's not a moral one for anybody who's thinking about going into this work. Because regardless of what you want the system to look like eventually, we know what the system looks like now. And it needs you all, it needs each of you. I was not a very good lawyer, okay? So I didn't stick with it. But for those of you that will be great lawyers, which I'm sure is all of you, I recommend um, um, working in the system to the extent that that's what you want to do, because the pie, you know, the, the big ideas um, are valuable, but there can't be all that that is happening. Um, how do you advance abolition without Republicans reframing this as an anti-police movement? I suggest that you have to have talking points counter to the law and order narrative. That's also a great question. Thank you, Vincent. So um, I think <laughs> Uh, a re the, the reason that I find this question particularly interesting is in light of the past month, okay? So um, we actually see that policing is a talking point volleyed between the two parties when it's convenient. And it's not actually that Republicans are, um, are so tied to police as an infrastructure without exception, um, you know, many police officers died in, in, in the aftermath of the Capitol riots recently, M multiple police officers, right? Um, the fact that that hasn't been a bigger deal has been shocking to me um, because these are the people who, who say thin blue line, who say boys in blue, um, you know, who are willing to defend the police at, at, at basically every juncture. But the police are a political tool like any other political tools. And I'm actually not convinced that Republicans um, are willing to you know that this that that there's not something more important for Republicans than than police. Um, but I also want to say that one of the failures of our system is that police and the carceral state are extremely embedded in um, regular people's lives. And so you know you go to a local like many rural towns, and the entire economy is the local prison, right? Many people, including myself, have police and their families. Um, policing has been seen as traditionally a strong union, um, you know, um, stable job for the average person. And so I understand that police um, policing is not just theoretical, it's it is um, it is also relationships, right? It is also people in our communities and that addressing that is not just a Republican or Democrat issue, but is a very real concern um, that we have to think about when we think about how the carceral state has, has embedded itself in our system. It's both so much of what's tragic about the system and so much of what makes it hard to dismantle. Um, John Chiaski, um, who is my friend from law school and is still a very good lawyer, stuck with it, um, asked, about how abolitionists, abolitionists should respond to police violence and how they should respond to the DC insurrection. I find this question um, very difficult. Uh, I do, I find it really hard. I find the insurrection question in particular really hard because it is very difficult for me to imagine a world in which we don't hold people accountable for storming the Capitol to try to overthrow a democratic election. I think that is a 
that is concerning. And I think um, given the systems of accountability we have, I'll say that I'm not losing a ton of sleep over the fact that some of these people are being charged. That being said, I still don't think this addresses the problem, right? And so while it's not, I'm not losing a lot of sleep, <laughs> I, I still don't think that this system is going to address the concerns and the, and the, um, the, the culture that we saw rearing its head at the Capitol. It's not going to address the alt-right. It's not going to address QAnon. We're not going to police that out of our communities. We're not gonna police stop the steal out of our communities. We are going to have to address at a root, um, you know, the issues that people have, the concerns that they have um, in, in, and, the, and the ability for, these narratives to take hold. It is a sign of societal rot, not a sign of under policing these people that um, we got to where we did on January 6th, right? As far as how they should respond to police violence, I think it's worth pointing out, as I tried to say earlier, that um, the fact that we have no accountability for state actors in our system is a very real problem, right? It is a problem that you police officers can kill with impunity and never suffer for it. Um, you want the state to be accountable to the people. And so I don't um, disagree that there should be accountability for people, for police officers who um, commit harm. And given the system we have right now, that accountability might look like charges. It might look like losing your job. It might look like a lot of different things. That being said, um, when you are relying on the system to police the system, you are going to lose. <laughs> and that is what we see day after day in and day out. And so the idea that um, the idea that we could have a system that that did ensure accountability over the carceral state is kind of a fiction to me. So um, overall, I think that the police, I mean, the, my abolitionist response to police violence is that Again, this is not working. The system is not able to be accountable for the people within it, um, and that we have got to address this some other some other way. Um, I I think um, Mora's point, Mora made the point about policing in white suburbs, and so much of our society's attachment to policing is in part driven by the mythos and the pre political creation of the white suburb. Um, and I think that this is a really important point, and some have made it after. Um, the kind of suburban analogy was going around, which is that suburbs are themselves product of um, a, a class war, white supremacy, um, and a, a disinvestment in communities of color and poor communities, which I think is right. I'm not arguing that every place should look like, should, should replicate the suburbs as much as I'm asking people to imagine what life is like sometimes for, very often for people in the suburbs, because I think that the imagination can open people's eyes to the possibility of, you know, um, less virtually no criminalization, not because I think we should all replicate the suburbs writ large, but that we should all be able to imagine that some people, particularly rich people in America, live a very different life in terms of interaction with police than poor people do. And once you can imagine, once you can see that there are communities in America that are not criminalized, that don't have the specter of police raining down on them, you can imagine um, what that could look like in other places. Um, a couple of people asked about, um, about international models that we can look to and learn from. And, um, and I wanna reinforce that, you know, um, I think the international models you wanna think about are about international economic systems, international priorities, inter international budgeting. Where do other countries put their resources? What do they value? And how is that reflected in their, um, in, in, um, in, in their society, right? And so I would not argue that we should go to, you know, I, I've been to all, I've been to prisons in I think 38 states now. I've been to prisons in other countries and you go and they say, look at this beautiful, look at this, we have this and tea. Um, but you can't just pick that system up and put it in America because we don't, we we don't have the same society as these places, right? We don't we don't have enough food for elementary school kids, right? We don't have um, you know, we we are not sending 
kids to to quality schools we're not providing quality parks we don't have good after you know we don't have good job opportunities we don't have a high minimum wage we don't have a, a a general system of social security in this country and so the idea that we can just replicate another country's police system especially given the racist history of our own i think is um is uh, wrong. And so what I would say is that like when we think about what we should take from other countries, we should think about what we should take writ large and how those and, and how changing our other systems can change our um, carceral system, not just the idea that we want to pick something up and try to integrate it into a society that doesn't value those things to begin with. Um, um, I don't how much time do I have? I think we are about at time if you want to just uh, wrap up. Uh, um, and if anybody else has other questions, they can always email me. Um, I, my email address is just josie.duffy at gmail.com. And I love answering stuff. So I have two kids, so it might take me a few days to get back to you, but I will eventually um, once these two toddlers I have give me a break. Um, uh, I'll ask, I think Alicia's question is a great one. So I'll ask that last. Um, there are lots of great ones, but this is the next great one. Um, how can we individually and collectively build trust within communities to allow for more personal accountability measures and community-based options to address harms? So I think that's a really great question because it's something we all are responsible for and we can all do today. You should, again, get to know your neighbors, right? You should know who in your community, in your kind of immediate community, can use your help. You should go to town hall meetings or community board meetings. You should do what you probably do in your personal relationships anyway. Right now, if someone came to you and said, um, I am struggling with addiction, would you call the cops? Probably not, right? If one of your friends said that, you'd probably try to get them help and address their issues um, through the people that love them. You would probably try to address the problem and not just punish the problem. So I think that we all do this to some extent in our lives, but our communities tend to be small um, and, that, and they're shrinking, I think even more in the age of a pandemic, right? We're not, we don't always know the people around us. We don't always know the people that we um, don't have just direct relationships with and that we, we're ends in a, in a lack of accountability, right? So it is, should be all of our goal to just create more community around us as a rule to be the person in your apartment building or on your block that people know they can go to in a time of emergency to, you know, to uh, one example that people give all the time is opening like a little free library in your front yard that creates like a sense of community, right? To, to planning um, events and knowing people's names and asking questions and joining community boards. I mean, all of this is part of a, a responsibility chain that um, can hopefully eventually lessen the influence that this system has on us. Um, and so I, I encourage everybody to think of that as your own little movement towards abolition, right? Who can you help without requiring the system to be involved? Um, what can exist without it requiring the system to be involved? And I think that is the, the goal. Great, thank you so much. I feel like I have a full notebook of a bunch of things that you said. Um, thank you, this was incredible. I, we still have a bunch of questions and I'm sorry that we couldn't get to all of them. Um, this was honestly so amazing. I, I, especially as an aspiring lawyer who's dealing with the idea of working within a system, but also, also pushing it from the outside, the imagery of what you said about pushing from all sides to make it topple, uh, really resonated with me and it's a con like an ongoing conversation. Um, so again, thank you so much. I wish we could give you like a round of applause or some oh, sort I'm of- really, I'm so grateful that you all um, would even have me. So thank you so much. If anybody, I'm gonna try to answer some of these questions in the Q and A. Um, um, just by typing them. And then if anybody has anything else, please reach out to me. But thank you guys so much for having me. Um, and I hope I gave you some things to think about. Great. Thank you so much. So we're just going to move to kind of a transition period before our next panel, which everyone should stick around for. The next panel is uh, Abolitionist Frameworks for Housing Justice. Uh, I'm really excited about it as well, as you can probably feel my excitement, hopefully through Zoom. Um, so if you guys just want to stick around, we're going to put up a quick like transition slide, um, but feel free, of course, to go stretch your legs, do whatever it is that you need to do. We'll be back in a few minutes. Thanks, everyone.